Thank you so much, Dwayne. Um, it really is um, an honor to be here this evening. Um, thank you for joining us to discuss early childhood education and its critical role in what we're calling pre-K 20 plus pathways. Our robust research agenda as a school has helped propel us really in the global rankings recently as a school of education where we've been ranked as number eight among schools of education in the world and as a top 10 school in the United States. Before we begin our conversation on this important work, I first wanna thank Richard and Cheryl Russett. Richard and Cheryl, hi Richard, thank you. Cheryl, for hosting this important opportunity. Through their generous support, they are providing a space to connect, to converse, um, and to have a meaningful discussion about the current issues happening in early learning in Orange County and beyond. The research that happens around early childhood is so vital in the advancement of education for young learners and to their social, cognitive, emotional, and physical development. There is a positive association, as you may know, and as you all probably know, between early childhood services, including school, on a child's lifelong well-being, and we know that these development and education opportunities are also affected by the environmental and social factors that surround them, such as socioeconomic status, relationships with parents, and access to education programs. Recognizing that early learning impacts every child on their pathway through education systems and their well-being, the School of Education has placed early childhood education as one of our top priorities. It is in our strategic plan as one of our top 10 priorities going forward in the next five years. And you will meet many of our amazing colleagues and scholars in this area this evening. We are engaging in critical research on conversations surrounding early learners in our classrooms, in our labs, and on the ground with our various partnerships across the region. We are committed to serving the whole child by developing holistic strategies and frameworks that connect families to early learning resources, culturally responsive information, services, and opportunities. And by doing so, we are informing early learning policy practices and child development. In this area, our renowned faculty are doing tremendous work as national leaders who are conducting cutting edge synergistic research projects that are maximizing early learning opportunities and informing solutions that invest in students that invest in families, and more broadly, the future of our state and nation. Tonight, you will get a chance to speak with many of them, as I mentioned, and learn about their impactful research, specifically their work in the early education space. So bear with me, because I have a few people to embarrass <laughs> that are here with us this evening. The first is the man of the hour, our distinguished professor, Greg Duncan. Greg, you want to wave hello? Professor Duncan, who has studied the economic mobility of the U.S. population, his, his larger uh, introduction is coming, but largely focusing on low-income families. His recent research studies the importance of skills and behaviors developed during childhood in promoting children's eventual success in school and the labor market. The next is Professor and Associate Dean, Senior Associate Dean Young Sook Kim. Dr. Kim, hi. <laughs> Dr. Kim's primary research areas include the development of language, cognition, and literacy skills across languages and writing systems for monolingual children, bilingual or multilingual learners, and English learners. Her work has been conducted in the US and internationally. Assistant Professor Andres Bustamante. Hi, Andres. Good to have you here. Dr. Bustamante designs and implements play-based installations in everyday spaces, such as bus stops and grocery stores, to encourage STEM learning. He is also utilizing digital platforms to provide professional development to early childhood teachers to support them in engaging in hands-on activities. Welcome, Dr. Bustamante. Associate Professor Jay Jenkins. Dr. Jenkins, wave hello, yes. <laughs> Dr. Jenkins studies early childhood development policy and focuses on issues that are amenable to policy intervention using diverse research methods to evaluate programs and understand mechanisms that promote child and family well-being. She is currently on the California Department of Education research design team, taking a deeper look at the universal pre-kindergarten rollout. Very important work as it affects the entire state of California. Welcome, Dr. Jenkins. We have Professor and Associate Dean of Faculty Development and Diversity, Dr. Elizabeth Pena. Hi, Liz. Welcome. Dr. Pena's research focuses on differentiating language impairment from, child, from language difference. She develops dynamic assessments that test a child's ability to learn new language skills in contrast to standardized tests that assess what children already know. Welcome, Dr. Pena. 
We have Professor Stephanie Reich. Dr. Reich, are you? Yes, we're right over there. Hi, Stephanie. Um, many of you have been gifted uh, Dr. Reich's books by our School of Education, so thank you. That's a, via Stephanie. Her research, to under, her research understands and improves the social context of children's lives, including scalable parenting interventions, assessment, and design of digital technology, education of, and engagement with healthcare providers, and partnerships with early education settings. Welcome, Dr. Reich. We have Chancellor's Professor of Education Emerita, Dr. Deborah Vandell. Deborah, yes. <laughs> Many of you might know Deborah as well because she is the first Dean of the School of Education here at UC Irvine, so she has many claims to fame. That's also one of them. But she is also a stellar and standout scholar in the nation and the world. Dr. Vandell's research focuses on the effects of developmental context, such as early childhood, families, organized activities on social, behavioral, and academic functioning. She has one of the most comprehensive studies of the effects of early education programs, schooling, and families on children's development. Welcome, Dr. Vandell. We have Professor Mark Warshower. Dr. Warshower. Dr. Warshower is one of the most widely cited scholars in the world on the use of digital learning to promote school readiness and academic achievement among diverse children. He has a partnership with PBS Kids and Sesame Workshop to improve STEM learning and engagement through AI conversation. He is also developing one of the first elementary computer science curricula targeted at the needs of English language learners. Welcome, Professor Warshower. And then finally, uh, we have Associate Professor, Dr. Drew Bailey. Drew? Yes, hi, Drew. <laughs> Dr. Bailey's research is working to improve the effectiveness of early childhood interventions through psychological theories, methods, and expert predictions. Dr. Bailey is building models to improve, statistical models, to improve the effects of educational interventions. Welcome, Dr. Bailey. So that's just a handful of our faculty that really focus and are known for early childhood research in the School of Education. As you can see, just an impressive array of faculty. And as you can imagine, the depth and range of interdisciplinary research are expansive in the School of Education, and it's thanks to the leadership. I, I come from a long legacy and strong legacy of leadership from our two previous deans. Our faculty are truly embedded in the conversations and the work around early childhood education in Orange County and beyond. We look forward to the discussions that will transpire tonight with our impressive group of faculty and all of the members that are researching in this area. Now for the man of the hour and our keynote. I have the honor of introducing distinguished professor Greg Duncan, who is a member of the National Academy of Education and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Duncan's research and career has highlighted the importance of early childhood as an important policy investment. He has also explored the importance of early academic skills, cognitive and emotional self-regulation and health in promoting student success in school and over the long term in the labor market. Dr. Duncan has served as president of the Society for Research in Child Development, and he has been awarded the Klaus J. Jacobs Research Prize, a very prestigious prize in the field of education. Dr. Duncan has also been named the Kenneth Boulding Fellow of the American Academy of Political and Social Science and he has received the Society for Research and Child Development Award for distinguished contributions to public policy and practice in child development. It is truly an honor to have him as a distinguished member of our faculty in the School of Education. Without further ado, I would like to welcome distinguished professor Greg Duncan to the stage to share his keynote presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Contreras, uh, for that wonderful introduction. And thanks, everybody, for coming tonight. It's, uh, it's great to uh, have conversations with a bunch of very interesting people. Um, so let me talk for a little bit. Uh, I, I'm not going to hold up your dinner, because I'm told your dinner is going to be served as I talk. So that's good. Um, but uh, I want to provide a fairly broad perspective on early childhood. We know learning takes place in early childhood education settings, uh, but we know most learning really takes place at home with the family. Uh, and we know that uh, the kind of opportunities that parents have to provide learning opportunities to their kids uh, are constrained by uh, their economic resources, right? So I wanna 
talk very broadly uh, about the role of child poverty uh, as it affects school readiness. One very shocking fact uh, is that children coming from low-income families, the bottom 20% of the income distribution, uh, when they enter kindergarten uh, are already a year behind in terms of their early learning, um, kids who grow up in higher status families, families with incomes in the top 20% uh, of the income distribution. So there are many reasons why that might be the case. Um, this gap that shows up early on persists all the way through uh, high school. So it's one uh, of the potentially most intractable problems uh, that early education faces, that, uh, that economic support uh, policies face. You can think about all the service domains that affect early childhood development. There's health, there's early education, um, there's, um, there's employment. Uh, employment for parents uh, can be very good for kids. Uh, but there's also economic support. And our country has a, a broad-based uh, safety net uh, that's somewhat uh, more miserly than uh, the safety nets in a lot of other industrialized countries. Um, but I want to focus on, um, on this economic component. If you track, again, the families in the top 20% and the bottom 20% with consumer expenditure surveys, uh, recent ones and back into the 1970s, uh, what you find is that t families today uh, in the higher income bracket, this is income above about $150,000 a year, uh, are spending on average about $10,000 per child per year on all their kids. $10,000. That's about three times as much as it was in the early 70s. Um, and it's much higher, as you might expect, than what low-income families spend on kids. Uh, they spend equal proportions, but the income levels are so much higher. Um, so you can imagine all the things that $10,000 per child per year can buy. Uh, and you can imagine what sort of headwind. I mean, it's great that, that parents want to spend money on behalf of their kids, uh, buy them high-quality child care, lessons, uh, tutors, all the things, private school perhaps, all the things that money can buy in terms of child enrichment. Um, but uh, we want to know to what extent that money is really making the difference. So the dilemma is to try to understand what the, really, what the real causal role of poverty is. To what extent is, is income the active ingredient for, uh, for kids ending up in kindergarten uh, with these very dramatic differences? If you were to provide more income to low-income families, brought some of them above the poverty line, would it make a difference, right? And there are a lot of uh, ideas that it's not income, it's parental education, it's culture. You know, you can talk about all the kind of political debates over this. Um, and that's what uh, I want to be talking about, to what extent income is kind of the active ingredient in producing child well-being. Um, if, if it were a matter of income, the solution is really fairly straightforward um, because we know very well how to reduce child poverty. Uh, I had the honor of chairing the National Academy of Sciences Committee that issued a report in 2019 um, that was charged by Congress with coming up with ideas for reducing child poverty. And the goal was come up with ideas that would reduce child poverty in half uh, in 10 years. That was kind of the congressional mandate. Um, so it wasn't that we were recommending any particular programs. We were trying to deliver um, a, a, a portfolio of possible programs that Congress might consider uh, that either together or singly might uh, reduce child poverty. So we did our work, published a report in 2019, and one of the things that we found, um, well, one of the things is uh, it, you kind of get what you pay for in terms of poverty reduction. Uh, programs that reduce poverty more cost more too. But the one that really stood out in terms of dramatic reductions in child poverty uh, was a $3,000 per child per year child allowance uh, in the form of an extension of the child tax credit 
uh, down to families with uh, very low incomes. Uh, child tax credit has been around for 25 years. If you're raising a child and your income is under $400,000 for two parent kids, uh, you're getting $2,000 per child. I mean, before uh, the, the uh, American Rescue Plan came in, it was $2,000 per child per year through the income tax system, right? So people with uh, middle and high incomes, uh, up to $400,000, we're getting this child credit. Most don't realize that. It comes out of their bottom line and taxes. Uh, but it was set up so that people with zero taxable income would not receive any benefit whatsoever. Zero, right? So the idea for this $3,000 uh, extension was to provide a $3,000 instead of $2,000 per child per year um, tax credit, but then make it available all the way down to families with zero income, all right? So everybody with incomes up to $400,000 a year gets $3,000 per child per year. Uh, for young kids, it's $3,600 per child per year. That was the, uh, the idea that we proposed in this 2019 report. Um, you know, at the time, we had no thought that anyone was gonna pay attention to uh, this report because the expense, you can see, it's about $60 billion a year. But lo and behold, the pandemic came along and the pandemic relief package uh, really opened up people's ideas about what sort of possibilities there were for providing uh, relief to families. And part of the American Rescue Plan was for 2021, uh, there was a $3,000 per child per year uh, child tax credit that was completely refundable. Uh, six months uh, there were checks and the other six months came in the form of a tax refund. So this was in place uh, in 2021. Uh, and on the basis of, uh, of a simulation model that we had as part of the committee work, uh, we simulated that this child tax credit would reduce child poverty by about 50% right away. Uh, and last August, we... Um, saw from the Census Bureau what the impacts were on child poverty from everything that was in place in 2021. Uh, and lo and behold, it was about a 50% decrease in child poverty. That program stopped in 2021. Uh, so we'd expect this August when they report about 2022, that child poverty rates will probably go back up to where they were before. But let me return to this question. Is it gonna make a difference, right? What is the causal role of income, poverty, on child development? So that's a very contentious question because people have all sorts of views about whether it's income or not. So to, to resolve whether income is the active ingredient behind child development or is one of the active ingredients, uh, you really need to do a, a clinical trial type study, right? Where you're, you're abstracting away from all the other differences that low income and higher income families have uh, and with a clinical trial, you can randomly assign half to getting uh, a substantial supplement or a much more modest uh, payment. And then you can track the two sets of families and try to see where they end up, where their kids end up. Uh, are you really going to observe differences in child development after a couple of years between the kids and the families that got the $4,000 per year, that's what we were paying, uh, versus a very modest amount? So this study is called Baby's First Years. Uh, we started planning it in 2011, uh, and we started collecting data in 2017. It was a very uh, long planning period. Um, it's, uh, so it's about a $23 million study so far. Uh, it's supported in part by the federal government from the National Institutes of Health, uh, but uh, also most of the money is actually coming from private donors, from, from foundations as well as philanthropists. So we spent uh, a lot of money trying to fundraise. Um, and we recruited four sites around the country that we tried to choose for diversity in terms of safety net benefits and cost of living and so forth. Uh, and we ended up with New Orleans, New York City, Omaha, and the Twin Cities. Uh, I really tried hard to get an Orange County site for the uh, study. Uh, but the but then uh, a bunch of philanthropists from Omaha stepped forward and said, you know, we really want Nebraska to be part of this study. Uh, so we went with Nebraska. Um, 
And the idea is to set up shop in birth hospitals in these four cities. Uh, and shortly after mothers give birth, to ask if they're willing to talk with us and they do a screening interview to see whether they have incomes below the poverty line. We just wanted low income women. Um, and then if they did, uh, again, we asked for consent to enroll them in this study. Uh, and we kept going until 1000 uh, mothers have been enrolled, about 250 in each of these four sites. Um, and that's our, our, our study sample, 1000 uh, low income moms. And the idea was in the hospital, after they uh, consented to participate in the study, um, they were handed a debit card. And the debit card was either loaded up with $333, uh, the first monthly installment, versus $20. All right, everybody got something. Uh, and the idea was that this card was gonna be loaded up with that amount, 333 or 20, every month for up to age six. Right, so $4,000 a year versus $240 a year. If income really makes a difference and you're tracking these families and the kids, then it ought to show up in how the families are, uh, are spending money on the kids, how the families are, uh, the parents are experiencing uh, stress and, and depression and things like that. But we also are monitoring how the kids are doing. Right? So the kids are really the, the payoff to the study. Uh, and let me tell you a little bit about uh, what we're finding. So the two major questions are, first and foremost, are these payment differences gonna make a difference in how kids turn out? Uh, and then the second question is why? What is it about the families that's changing or that's differing between these low cash and high cash families uh, that might explain why the kids are doing better or not. So our first uh, results came out in a uh, national uh, proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences article about a year ago, almost exactly a year ago. Um, and it looked at uh, the impact of these differential payments on infant brain activity. So age 12 months, uh, we took interviewers into the home they were conducting the interview and they had uh, these portable EEG machines that, uh, that would connect to these head nets. You can see the, uh, the head net here. You put the little caps on the kids. Uh, it's very non-invasive. And the caps really have uh, these little kind of microphones that are detecting electrical activity in the, uh, in the brain. So uh, if you have a child, um, Sitting still, and that's, you know, there are all sorts of ways of making kids sit still. I mean, it, you can't get every kid to have a cap put on its head, right? So that's a problem. But most of them were willing to do that. Uh, but then they sat in their mom's lap for five minutes, and then we recorded uh, brain activity, electrical activity in the brain with these caps. So um, this is me with a cap on. <laughs> I, as part of the training of interviewers in New York City. Uh, and above me is uh, Sonia Troller Renfrey. She was the major uh, neuroscientist involved in the study. And I gotta tell you, I was a little bit afraid that we might see some <laughs> flatlining uh, <laughs> from my brain. Uh, but lo and behold, there was activity. I mean, some of this activity, like the, the big jumps, that's an eye blink. So these are messy data. You've got to do a lot of cleaning. Uh, but the idea is each, each one of these lines comes from one of the electrodes, right, in the head net. Uh, and then you process these data and look to see uh, what sort of uh, electrical power differences there might be between the kids uh, in the low cash group and the high cash group, right, at 12 months. So that's what we did, and that's what was published in this article. Uh, one way of seeing the results is to uh, do kind of a heat map uh, at, at showing electrical activity, red is better, uh, in frequency bands uh, that are associated with greater cognitive development four or five years later, right? So you want to see red. Uh, and for both uh, this beta band as well as the gamma band, uh, you do see uh, considerable differences at 12 months of age 
right, between the low cash group and the high cash group. So it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an impressive early signal that there might be something going on. Uh, but the proof of the pudding is really going to come uh, soon as we uh, this, uh, assess the kids at age four. Um, so we had two goals. One was to see whether there were any differences, uh, and one was to try to explain why. So one of the things we asked in the questionnaire of the mom uh, was about spending on books and toys and things like that. Uh, we asked about uh, how much time per week do you, uh, how often do you, tell stories to your child, read a book with the child. Um, and when you look at group differences, right, between the low cash group and the high cash group, uh, you find quite significant differences in spending. The high cash gift group was spending about $70 more per child per month uh, for, these, uh, for these children. Uh, and they also reported uh, spending more time reading and uh, telling stories to their kids. Right? So that might be one clue as to why uh, these differences are emerging. Uh, we kept looking at other things. Uh, one of the worries uh, that emerges in a political debate over something like this uh, child tax credit extension uh, is about employment disincentives. Right? So we could ask questions about employment differences, uh, and we didn't find any, basically. Uh, all the way through age three, there were no significant employment differences. You know, we also wanted to take on stereotypes uh, about whether the money might be spent on drugs, alcohol, tobacco, opioids. We asked questions about those things. Uh, there were no differences whatsoever. Uh, there were pretty modest expenditures uh, on uh, things like alcohol and tobacco, but they didn't differ between the two groups. That was our main uh, focus. Uh, and the big surprise, um, you know, one of the stories about, um, about low-income families is how uh, stressful conditions are and how poverty alleviation might reduce the stress in ways that would lead to more responsive parenting and better child development. Um, so we had many measures of uh, maternal mental health, uh, and for none of them did we find that this high cash, low cash group difference was associated with, uh, with improvements in mental health. So that's all the way through age three, too. It's a big puzzle that we're trying to uh, solve now. Um, so it was preliminary at uh, 12 months of age. The proof of the pudding is really going to be uh, gathering data that we're in the middle of now. Uh, kids are coming in at age four to labs that we have set up. We have a university lab set up in each of the four sites uh, and getting EEG measured again, IQ tests, executive function assessment, behavior problems, you name it. Uh, there's some uh, cortisol um, measurement that we're doing. Uh, we're also videotape, videotaping a, um, a parent-child interaction. You can kind of set parents and kids up in a play task, and you can code that up for sensitivity. Uh, so we're in the midst of uh, doing that. Uh, our recruitment cycle was one full year, 12 months, um, and the, it, from July to June, right? So since last July, we've been bringing these kids into the lab. We're halfway through. We're gonna be done in, in June. Uh, it's gonna take us you know, a few months to, uh, to do Results, it's going to take forever to get things published because it always takes forever to get things published. But I'll know the results <laughs> by August, and, uh, and I might be willing to, uh, to tell someone if they were, if they were really interested. But, you know, it's, it's been 12 years now since we started uh, working on this, and this is the time, the reckoning. Right? to see whether or not this hypothesis that money really makes a difference uh, is, um, holds up or not. So uh, very suspenseful. Uh, but all of this is played out. There's a website, babiesfirstyears.com. But all this is played out in our wonderful School of Education. I've had a lot of support uh, with colleagues, some of whom are in the room, um, with uh, education school itself, with the support that it provides for uh, getting research grants and so forth. Uh, so I'm very grateful for that. But the biggest reward 
is the graduate students that you work with, right? Uh, I'm fond of telling junior faculty uh, that an academic's hope for immortality uh, is not their next article, uh, it's their next graduate student, right? Sending a graduate school a student off into the world with your training, it's not, it's gonna be combined with other experiences that they've had, uh, but it's been very rewarding over time to watch graduate students go off and uh, set up their own careers, some of whom I continue to collaborate with. Actually, one of the principal investigators uh, of our study is a former graduate student of mine who's now at the University of Wisconsin. So um, we're very excited about results coming up. Uh, we're very grateful for the opportunity to work with all the wonderful students that we, we're, we're just on the verge of uh, recruiting our next class of PhD students. Mark Warshauer is, uh, is in charge of that. Um, but, you know, another great crop looks like they're uh, coming in and it's just so exciting uh, and rejuvenating for an old person uh, to be able to work again with, uh, with such wonderful people. So thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if we have time for questions. What's the uh, program here? Okay. Good. Sure. Yeah, it was just the, the, the child that was uh, born exactly. during recruitment. So that's a difference between our study and the child tax credit. That's per child, right? So, you know, a family with three or four kids would get considerably more under the child tax credit scheme. But um, one of the things we're trying to do, we're, we're age four now. Um, we're trying to get money for an age six and age eight follow-up. Um, and we're trying to get siblings to come in uh, and get assessment as well, because we want to know whether money that's, um, that's directed to a child, you can't really control what money's spent on, whether there are spillover benefits for other kids in the family. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. You sound like a researcher. <laughs> you know, age, through age three, we did, uh, we did in person uh, at age one until the pandemic hit. We got about two thirds of the way through. So the EEG results are just for the two thirds where we could do home visits. Then we did telephone interviews at age two. Then we did telephone interviews at age three. Um, we, of the thousand, we got 937 uh, in the first year. 932 in the second year and 924 in the third year. So, you know, spectacularly well. Um, the, it's tougher to bring families into labs. You know, after three or four years, they've moved around. Um, so our goal is to get at least 800 uh, for the, the lab visit and maybe as many others by phone as we can to ask behavior problems, things you can get over the phone. Um, but we'll see. And one of the things that keeps me up at night is uh, are we going to be able to, you know, it really makes a big difference about the quality of a study if you have a 90% response rate or a 60% response rate, right? It's the one quality indicator that people pay the most attention to. So the, for the first 25 years of my life, I was at the Survey Research Center at the University of Michigan and working on a single study that chased the same families year after year after year. Um, and, you know, response rate was everything and we were able to get like 97, 98% response rates every year. Um, so I lived that for 25 years before I went off to Northwestern and then I came here and now I'm reliving it. So, <laughs> so I'm a glutton for punishment, but that, you know, response rate is clearly uh, a big focus of ours right now. Oh, yeah, yeah, so uh, yes, that's the second part of your question. Um, th there are uh, differences every year in the uh, response rate. It's about a um, maybe four percentage point difference between the response rate for the high cash group, which is higher than low cash group. Um, 
you know, we really try everything to try to, uh, the, we, we pay them every time for an interview, right? So that, that's an incentive. Uh, but we can't get over this uh, fact. I, I suppose even though we tell families that in, in no way does your cooperation now with the research have any bearing on the continuity of these payments that you're going to get, but I think some of them still link that in their minds. Um, so, you know, with a 93% response rate, if it's 95 and 92, uh, there's still not that much scope for bias. And you can do, we, we have a lot of baseline information to try to see whether it's, um, whether they differ, the two groups. Um, and you can do adjustments, but, you know, that, that does keep me up at night. Yes? I'm just curious, have you seen this study being Uh, there have been a lot of uh, cash programs in developing countries, um, often with very impressive results. Um, you know, it's so hard to generalize from a developing country context to a U.S. context, right? Because the, the kind of baseline conditions uh, upon which this cash uh, is, um, is, is allocated uh, is, is so different, right? Here, um, with the safety net, there's basic medical care for most kids. There's food stamps or SNAP. Um, so there are a lot of benefits that provide a floor, and we're going on top of that. So our families, on average, have uh, about a $20,000 a year income. So we're maybe increasing that by 20%, which is you know not huge, uh, but it's $4,000 a year. So uh, I think I would expect bigger impacts in developing country contexts um, than in the US, uh, but we'll see. Yeah. So of the families that you work with, do any of them, knowing that they're getting the stipend, ever ask for resources for child development or how they should spend that? And if they do or if they don't, how do you support that or navigate that? Yeah, that, that's very tough because uh, you, you want to keep this as pure as possible as researchers, but at the same time, you want to be responsive to parents. Um, so we have these resource sheets that are available to all the families that uh, connect them with local services of various kinds. So um, even those are provided if there's any information um, of that kind. Um, but they're provided equally to everybody, right? So we want to keep that kind of constant between the two groups. Yeah. And then second question on top of that, do you ask for reporting or information in your interviews on how that, how the amount is spent based on the child as they as they get older? Or? Well, yeah, that we ask uh, every year a set of expenditure questions, okay. uh, uh, expenditures on the kids. Um, expenditures on food, expenditures on rent, right? All the, about neighborhood quality, neighborhood mo residential mobility, all the kind of things that money might buy that might affect child. Uh, it, it's not a complete expenditure survey, uh, and it's not a complete time use survey, which we wish we could have had, uh, but we're trying to get enough key elements to um, uh, be able to detect, and you know, it, it seems like we are finding some differences in expenditures, right? It is this $70 per child difference that's showing up between the high cash and low cash group as consistent age one, age two, age three. Um, so, uh, so families really are using this money uh, on behalf of their kids to a significant extent.